I'm Leslie Cornwell, Midwifery Business Consultation. This section of the course has to do with birth terminology. I had found over the years that it was really nice to get to the basics. When you have a midwife apprentice, you have a newer doula, you have a, a new birth assistant training. Um, there's so much medical lingo that many birth workers just aren't familiar with and just basic anatomy so that you can help advocate for families and be um, communicate to the, the medical community to improve your safety of care, especially in transports and um, more emergent situations. So this section, it's not all encompassing. These are more commonly discussed um, acronyms, um, terms used, definitions that I found helpful over the years to give a handout to the students um, and to give newer hires with the practice. So we talk about the anatomy, we talk about pregnancy, we talk about birth, we talk about complications, um, postpartum, breastfeeding, newborn, just common um, terminology and things. So it's not everything. There's going to be things missed, um, but it's just a good generalization to help as a baseline knowledge reference for birth professionals. So basic terminology, when someone says a support team, that could include a partner, spouse, mother, aunt, friend. Um, the support team can also include the birth team, but usually when it's referenced, it's not the professional birth workers. It's usually their warm um, market family that they have um, invited to the birth. Um, the birth team usually is referencing the, the professional birth workers attending. Um, so the birth team can be a midwife in the hospital setting, traditionally a doctor, a doula, a birth assistant, a midwife assistant, a midwife apprentice. Um, it's just the team that you have present to be at the birth, whether the birth center, home or hospital setting. Birth plan, birth preferences have to do with the mom's wishes and writing so that the birth team has something to reference when it's two in the morning what are her specific wishes and wants for this birth experience um, i find it more helpful in the hospital setting to have birth plans and birth preferences but it's nice if you have a larger volume out of hospital practice to be able to have in writing as an easy reference um, what her wishes are versus asking during labor um, education classes, there's a lot of those. There's childbirth classes, some of the more branded names, Lamaz, hypnobirthing, um, there's newborn classes, there's breastfeeding classes. There's a lot of support groups. There's a lot of great things in everyone's communities. Um, contractions, that has to do with the tightening of the uterus. Um, there's Braxton Hicks contractions, and then there's the contractions during labor. The biggest difference between the two is the strength and intensity. They have a purpose behind them, the ones to get the baby out versus the, the Braxton Hicks contractions or practice contractions. A mucus plug, it's this protective seal that's inside the cervix over the baby's head that may release before the baby comes out. It may come out during labor. Um, it helps to reduce the risk of infection. Um, it doesn't hint that labor is going to happen in 48 hours, 24 hours, two weeks if she loses her mucus plug. It just means that the cervix has gotten ripened, softened enough that it's opened and thinned so that that mucus plug protection, it just means the body's getting ready. A speculum, um, I like to talk about that because people get a speculum exam and a pelvic exam often mixed up. Um, a speculum is actually the plastic tool used to do the pelvic exam if you wanted to visualize the cervix um, inside the vagina. Um, do a test of any sort. A pelvic exam is taking your fingers and actually doing the vaginal exam to see what presenting parts. So is the head down? Is the um, baby's butt down? Is the baby breech? Um, how open is the cervix? So that's dilation. How thin the cervix is? Is it effacement? And what level the baby's head is in the pelvis based on the ischial spines? And that more is the station of the baby. Lightning 
is more of a subjective description. Um, women may feel that the baby has dropped in her pelvis. People around her towards the end of the pregnancy may say the baby looks like it's really dropped, it's lowered. Um, women would commonly describe, I'm not having as much heartburn and shortness of breath, but I'm definitely having increased pelvic pressure. I'm having a harder time, um, increased urination, having a hard time getting comfortable at nighttime. My hips are really sore. Um, I traditionally see lightning more common um, farther in advance with first time moms, like a month in advance. When they've had a baby before, it's usually right before labor ha happens or during labor. Um, nesting is a cultural subjective term of the mom getting ready and um, cleaning and getting prepped. She has this instinctual urge to get everything ready for the baby to come out in her home. So laundry, um, cleaning the floors, scrubbing, um, getting the baby room all set, folding clothes, all those little things are that instinctual nesting. Anatomy terminology, um, just looking at this picture of a mom towards the end of the pregnancy and the uterus is the actual muscle that holds the baby. Um, it's really small but when she's not pregnant and then as the baby grows it expands, it gets thinner, the wall um, isn't as thick. It's, it's an amazing organ inside of a woman's body. Placenta is made just for this baby as soon as she becomes pregnant. The placenta will attach to the inside of the uterine wall and it is the lifeline that gives the oxygen, the food, the blood, the nutrition to the baby throughout the pregnancy. The umbilical cord is attached to the placenta. Um, many cultures call it the tree of life. After the baby is born, the placenta delivers and the placenta can be just disposed of. It can be used as fertilizer to start a tree. There are many people that do placenta encapsulation. There's a lot of cultural rituals that are done with placentas because it's a very powerful organ just made for the baby. And then as soon as the baby is delivered, it has its, its purpose is no longer there anymore. The umbilical cord um, is cut, usually delayed cord clamping a few minutes after delivery. And then the, the stump that's left on the baby um, will dry in a few days and fall off naturally. And then that's where everybody's belly button comes from. It's, it's a very powerful organ, the uterus, the placenta, the umbilical cord, all working together to support that baby throughout the pregnancy. Amniotic fluid has to do with the water. It could be cloudy, it could be clear, it could be meconium stained, having a little bit of baby poop in it. Um, it's the fluid that's around the baby. The baby is imitating breathing towards the end, but they don't get air and actual breathe until they're outside of their mother. So they're just swallowing the amniotic fluid and then they, um, their lungs don't actually open up until after birth. So the vagina is actually the opening that the baby will come out of and there's a lot of amazing hormones during labor that makes that muscle connective tissue very elastic, um, increases the blood flow throughout the pregnancy because of all the estrogen, progesterone, um, all the hormones that drastically increase prepping throughout the pregnancy and for this baby to come out. The perineum is just that generalized area between the vagina and the rectum, the anus. Um, it's the area that tends to have a higher chance of tearing during delivery, um, but just want people to understand the basic terminology that you can hear when discussing pregnancy and labor. So prenatal terminology, so antepartum is just defined as as soon as she gets pregnant before labor, that prenatal care. So from five weeks gestation to 40 weeks gestation is the antepartum period. GTPAL is very commonly seen on prenatal records. It's used as a medical communication tool. Gravita has to do with um, how many pregnancies, term pregnancy, so how many between 37 weeks gestation to 42 weeks gestation, how many preterm deliveries, um, any deliveries before 37 weeks. Um, if it is before 20 weeks, it's typically listed in the category of the abortion section. 
Um, and then being able to understand with abortion miscarriage, is it a spontaneous abortion, an SAB, or is it an elective abortion, um, EAB? That is important to know with history. And then how many living children? Um, just because she had one pregnancy, she may have had twins. It may be really important to know the children. And then the other direction, she may have had a stillbirth at 36 weeks gestation, and so she may not have any living children, even though this is her second pregnancy. So it is important to know the GTPAL for the mother's history. LMP has to do with her last menstrual period. Um, as long as there's good, accurate dating, so three consistent cycles that are pretty... I'd say within a few days apart from each other. So her cycles are every 28 days. Her cycles are every 35 days. Um, you can calculate a pretty accurate due date for the mother, but it is a due month versus a due date. Um, but if she has an irregular cycle, we do encourage um, an ultrasound just to get more accurate dating the first trimester. EDD has to do with estimated due date, and we really stress as midwives estimated. Um, very rarely do people deliver on their due date. It's a five-week window of normal, healthy pregnancy. Many cultures don't even put an actual date. They'll just put a reference range, end of December, January, middle. Um, there's not an actual date on her records. And then we already talked about the miscarriage aspect. Gestational age has to do with how far along in the pregnancy she is. Um, some cultures will do it by months or just by trimesters. Um, but in the American society where we tend to want to know more and more accurate, we'll do gestational weeks. She's 12 weeks and five days, meaning that she's five out of the seven days of that week. Um, she's 14 weeks and two days. Um, she's 40 weeks and zero days. This is her exact due date. Um, pregnancy trimesters, there's three, um, first, second, and third, and then many people will reference the fourth trimester as postpartum. Um, so first trimester is traditionally with most references between zero to 12 weeks gestation. Um, second is usually 13 to 28 weeks gestation. And then the third trimester is traditionally 28 to 29 weeks all the way till delivery. Leopold's maneuver has to do with putting the hands on the mom's tummy. Um, usually after 28, 30 weeks gestation, it's a lot easier to do um, the actual position of the baby. So is the baby head down, vertex presentation, is the baby's butt down, breech presentation, is the baby oblique, meaning it's a little cockeyed, is the baby transverse, meaning completely sideways in the uterus. So um, there's skills that a midwife, a midwife's apprentice would have to help determine prenatally what are the recommendations spinning babies to get the baby to turn from breech, um, talk to a collaborating physician about a version, helping to turn the baby. Um, there's a lot of information from Leopold's maneuver and what side the baby's back is on, so it's easier to listen to the heart tones. There's just a lot of information given from doing Leopold's maneuver at each prenatal visit. Some more prenatal terminology, um, SGA, AGA, LGA has to do with small gestational age, average gestational age, and large gestational age. So this has to do with prenatally when the midwife is doing the fundal height, when she is taking the tape measure and measuring from the symphysis pubis all the way to the top of the uterus. Um, there's a reference range of normal. Traditionally, it's most people will say two centimeters below and two centimeters above, but there are some references of three centimeters below and above is normal. Um, but I think as midwives, we look at trends. If the midwife was always measuring high, then she started measuring right on, and then she started measuring less, we look at the bigger picture. Um, so it's actually a growth ultrasound is done, and it'll diagnose the baby in the less than 10th percentile or greater than 90th percentile. So less than 10th percentile is the SGA, small gestational age, um, and then determining the head compared to the body size. It may be IUGR, intrauterine growth restriction. Um, average gestational age, we're not going to be ordering an ultrasound for those babies. Those are those babies between that percentile range, 10th to 90th percentile. Um, and then the LGA, large gestational age, those babies measuring based on the parameters with the ultrasound of being greater than 90th percentile. Um, and, and just to stress, ultrasounds are estimates. They're give or take a pound, pound and a half both directions, and I really stress that to families. But it's a reference point to go from. We already talked about the vert vertex presentation. That's head down, 
breach presentation. There's three kinds of breach presentation and I have a picture of it attached. So complete breach is where the butt is down and the feet are curled. Looks more like an Indian style. Incomplete is one foot is up next to the baby's head and one foot is down. And then frank breach is where both feet are up by the baby's head. Some midwives in certain states, I know Texas, can do breach deliveries at a hospital, um, but it's getting a lost art to find healthcare providers that do breach deliveries anymore, especially for a first baby, because the concern is the head is the biggest part, and so that delayed um, delivery where the cord is being kinked and they're not getting good oxygen to the baby's brain is the main concerns um, with breach presentation. So we already talked about transverse presentation. That's the picture above, a um, little oblique, but with the baby's sideways and the mom's tummy. I see it a lot of times with women that have had lots of babies before um, and that uterus is really relaxed. Those abdominal muscles are a lot weaker. Um, so it's it's definitely something to have a discussion about encouraging the baby to get in a good position before labor. Reassuring fetal heart rate, FHR, has to do with that heart tones during labor. Prenatally is in that normal reference range, 110 beats per minute to 160 beats per minute. Um, Non-reassuring heart tones would be less than 110 and greater than 160. And then the midwife especially would be doing critical thinking or the healthcare provider. Why is the heart rate low? Why is the heart rate high? What are possible things we could be evaluating at our risk factors? Fetal kick counts that are discussed in the third trimester of the pregnancy has to do with one of the reassuring ways that moms can know their babies are getting good oxygen. We can ask mom all during pregnancy how she's doing, how she's feeling, but there's very few ways to assess the baby. We can't ask them that conversation. So getting a normal reassuring fetal heart rate, getting a good fundal height, no concerns or signs of preterm labor, um, so no vaginal bleeding, no um, pelvic pressure, no, um, no contractions of regular intensity. But the great thing with fetal kick counts, a mom, I always stress a wiggly baby is a happy baby. So babies that are moving around are getting good oxygenation inside their mom. So keeping, there's no hard rule. There's a lot of subjective guidelines for fetal kick counts. Um, so every place is different in having a discussion with your practice so everybody's on the same page. Um, I usually just stress to moms a drastic change from your baby's normal. If your baby, especially towards the end, is getting more sleep cycles, growth spurts, um, arousing that baby with something cool to drink, some sugar, and paying attention to the baby the next hour. If you're not getting some good response from the baby, there's simple tests we can do to check out the baby. Braxton Hicks contractions are those practice contractions before labor happens. Um, the uterus gets tight. It's just not as strong of an in intensity as labor to get the baby out there. Um, and then the maternal assessment is just when you first arrive at a mother's home or the birth center, there's usually a good maternal assessment done asking when the contraction started, um, how's her... How's she coping with everything? How intense is it? Any bloody show, any vaginal bleeding, any leaking of fluid? It's a lot of history questions, subjective data that's being collected from the mother and the family. And then objective data is the more official things the midwife is going to be getting, the vital signs, the vaginal exam, um, palpating the contraction strength. Are they mild? medium or strong um, to just getting that information, the baby's position, those Leopold's maneuver, those are all part of that maternal's assessment. Throughout labor, it's not nearly as in details. Um, every, I'd say every half hour when I did a fetal heart rate, I would do a maternal assessment. And then every four hours I would do vital signs. So the birth team terminology, so a midwife, there's a lot of different midwives out there. There's certified nurse midwives, there's certified professional midwives, there's direct entry midwives, there's traditional midwives. Um, certified nurse midwives traditionally are in the hospital setting. There's a few states um, near the East Coast that certified midwives and even certified professional midwives can get hospital privileges. Um, some states midwives are illegal and some do have licensure and some don't. And so midwife is a very con confusing term to the greater society, let alone understanding the different types of midwives and the educational path. So a certified nurse midwife has more of a nursing, um, science, medical background, and then a certified professional midwife, traditional direct entry is more of an apprenticeship model. 
So doctors, um, especially when you have a community you're collaborating with regularly, OBs or obstetricians, FP is a family practice um, doctor. Some hospitals still have family practice doctors doing OB services, peds, pediatrics. So that's a, a baby provider that specializes in children. And the neonatology neonatologist has to do with a high risk feed, fetal um, doctor. So they typically are you have maternal fetal medicine, you have neonatology, um, they're above obstetricians if you have a high risk situation. They'll refer to op obstetricians refer to MFM, maternal fetal medicine and neonatology. Doulas um, traditionally do not have a medical background. They're not going to be giving uh, medical advice, assessing. They're, they're hired by the family, the support team for labor support. Um, each doula's practice and scope um, is different. So I always stress like a, a midwife, a midwife's apprentice is going to be doing more the medical, the clinical decision making. They can definitely do labor support. They can do some of the roles of a doula. Um, but a doula is primary, especially in the hospital setting. It's a really vital um, tool to have undivided labor support for this woman um, so that her support team can rotate and get breaks. Um, birth slash midwife assistant, every state is different what they use for a term. So that's hired by the midwife um, to help as a second person for medical emergencies to um, help labor support. They traditionally will come in transition closer to delivery time, setting up supplies, cleaning up after birth, especially when there's a water birth, there's just a lot of extra things to do. So the midwife can do charting, keeping an eye on the mom and baby postpartum, helping with breastfeeding. Um, there's a lot of roles that a birth assistant can provide. A midwife apprentice is someone that's actively training with the midwife to learn to be a midwife. So their role, they're going to be asking different questions. They're a student. They're in a learning role. They're not so much hired by the midwife to be part of the birth team. They're in their clinical rotation to train to do what the midwife is eventually doing. So there's labor support terminology. So coping mechanisms has to do with the tools, the 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 way you talk to someone, the things you're using to help during labor. Um, so she could have her own coping mechanism. So she could be doing music. She could be doing um, hydrotherapy, the water use. She could be doing um, breathing techniques. And the, the birth team could be having coping mechanisms to help her, um, suggesting different labor positions, um, cold water, um, cool uh, washcloths on her back, effleurage, which is a um, slow caressing of her arm, holding her hand, um, giving good support of words are all different ways to help with the coping mechanism. Some people are better at coping than others, and it's depending on what stage of the labor. Um, latent labor tends to be a very exciting, uh, this is really happening stage. Active labor tends to be more of the serious, yep, this is happening. Um, so latent labor is usually the first four centimeters dilation. Active labor is usually four centimeters to seven centimeters. Transition is traditionally that seven centimeters to 10 centimeters. Transition is usually the hardest for most, most women. Some women get really nauseous. The contractions are the most intense. There's still a little bit of cervix left, so there's a lot of nerve endings. Um, it's it's a pre, if women are, are going natural and thinking about an epidural, this tends to be the time it happens. Um, and then when their cervix is complete and they hit that second stage of labor um, and start pushing, usually the women will have a lot more energy and be excited because now they can push to get their baby out and they're in the home stretch. Um, so there's many different labor positions. Um, you can have a birth ball, you can use water, you can walk around, hands and knees, sat, laying on your side. Um, there's many different positions to birth a baby in. Lithotomy is the standard position in the hospital setting um, where the bed is broken down and the woman is on her back with her her feet in the stirrups um, hands and knees squatting 
water tend to be more out of hospital birth positions, more the instinctual birthing positions. Um, side lying I've seen is a great option for women that have a history of going very fast. So precipitate deliveries, um, school laying on your side tends to not take gravity to accelerate the birth of the baby and can slow things down a little bit. But I've seen it do it the other direction where it rotates the baby just right and um, delivers quite quickly. I've had great births where they're standing and the support team is holding her slow dancing and she just squats slightly and delivers her baby. Hydrotherapy, I strongly encourage dis midwives discuss with their families. It's a great tool to offer during labor and for the birth um, to help with labor and the pressure on the pelvis. It takes away the gravity, the warmth, increase the blood flow. There's a lot of um, studies out there about how powerful hydrotherapy is to help with the um, coping mechanisms during labor. So birth terminology, um, intrapartum has to do more with the labor itself. So we talked about antepartum is prenatally. Intrapartum has to do with actual the birth period. Um, I already went into the basics. Latent labor is that earlier labor. She It could go on for a couple hours. It could go on for days, especially first-time moms. They can have this prodromal labor where um, it comes and goes, especially the more babies they have. Once they get past fifth, sixth, seventh baby, that prodromal revving up. It's just the body practices more. Um, active labor is more that four centimeters to seven centimeters. That's when the woman is working a lot harder than in the early labor. Um, transition is seven to 10 centimeters. That tends to be the hardest um, intensity of contractions, um, the most intense to the women. A lot of women, if they're debating on an epidural, I talked about it, that's the time that they're asking for pain medication because it's just really intense. Transition is, is the pits. And if we can get through that in 20, 30 minutes versus hours, that's awesome. Emesis has to do with a medical term for vomiting and throwing up. Active pushing versus passive pushing. Um, if the mom is, and even involuntarily pushing, so passive pushing is that she's just a little grunt here and there in between contractions, during a contraction, there's no full act of hard pushing on her behalf. Um, so I, and those are just terms a midwife would put on the charting. Involuntarily pushing is the mom's body, just like a body will involuntarily throw up. When the baby hits low enough station in the pelvis, it's called the Ferguson's reflex. The baby, I think it's around plus two station. Um, the body will actually hit an involuntary nerve and will, will actively push the baby out, whether the mom wants to be part of the pushing or not. Um, first stage of labor is what we went from zero centimeters to 10 centimeters. Second stage of labor is the actual pushing. Third stage of labor is the baby is out and waiting for the placenta to come. ARAM as active rupture of membranes. Um, it tends to be more in hospital deliveries to help accelerate the labor, especially if there's an induction or an augmentation. So induction is 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 medically causing the body to go into labor versus natural. Augmentation is accelerating the labor um, process with either Pitocin, breaking the water, um, or nipple stimulation. Um, P prom has to do with premature rupture of the membranes. That's naturally on its own before labor actively starts. Um, I see that more common in first time moms that it happens. If she's had a baby before and the water breaks, traditionally contractions and labor will start shortly after it. Um, SROM is spontaneous rupture of membranes. That's more common in the out of hospital setting. Um, and we tend to see SROM right close to delivery time when the baby is low low and putting a lot of pressure on that bag. Um, delivering, sometimes you can have the baby deliver directly in the the amniotic bag, which is called an call. I've seen it a few times and it's pretty awesome. So we've talked about meconium a few times. There's colors of the fluid when the water breaks. Um, meconium has to do with thin, thick particulate. So it's the, the baby poop. Um, before delivery. So if it's clear fluid, the baby hasn't had a bowel movement yet. If it's thin meconium, it, it's just a little bit. So you just see like a light um, brown tint on the pad. And then um, moderate meconium is 
it's it's thicker it's pretty obvious the baby had a bowel movement and then particulate actually has, has pieces it's it's that's more what people worry about with meconium aspiration for the baby is just thick um part little pieces that can get in the alveoli the little lung sacs for the baby when they try to breathe coming out of mom ebl estimated blood loss um, and a lot of places, especially in the hospital, are using QBL now, which is quantitative blood loss. Traditionally, in the out-of-hospital setting, we're still just estimating what's on the pad. Um, you can use the baby scale to weigh if you're worried about a postpartum hemorrhage, a PPH, um, just to get more accurate blood loss from the mother. Delayed cord clamping um, is traditional in out-of-hospital setting, um, usually waiting till it's done pulsating, so there's not an actual... Um, blood flow through the cord to the baby from the placenta anymore and that's usually about three to five minutes the hospital setting tends to do we've done delayed cord clamping as soon as the apgar um, machine on the baby warmer goes off at one minute the cord's being cut so there's no hard definition it just says you're waiting you're not immediately cutting as soon as, as soon as the baby comes out some definitions will say 30 seconds some definitions will say a minute some definitions will just say you've waited Vaginal delivery um, is the route of the baby being born through the vagina versus a cesarean section being born through the mom's abdomen during a surgery. Um, crowning is when the cervix is gone and the very end when the baby is coming out and the, um, the perineum, the vagina opening is being push to the max, that crowning, that ring of fire, that intense burning the mother's feeling right before the baby comes out. Um, natural birth is not having any medications or um, induction or augmentation, not causing the baby, the birth is happening on its own, her, her own oxytocin, her own endorphins are co her coping mechanisms for the labor process. Water birth is actively delivering the baby in the water. Um, there's a lot of myths out there and misunderstandings that the babies don't breathe until they hit the air. There's nerves on their cheeks, the trigeminal nerves, that when they get cool by the air, that'll cause the baby to breathe. So sometimes the babies, when they're delivered a land birth, when they're not delivered in the water, will will cry and breathe even before they're completely delivered, the head is out. It's because those cheeks are being exposed to that cooler air. So the babies go from water to water inside their mothers into the water and we just slowly will bring them up and put them on their mom's chest. Once they cry and they open up their lungs, you just keep them above the water. Lotus birth has to do with, it's not very common, but once in a while you'll see it. Um, instead of cutting the cord, the baby will stay attached to the umbilical cord and the placenta will be carried around by the mom um, with the baby until the cord naturally detaches on its own. Um, there's not a lot of studies about it with infection risks. It's just a certain culture. I've had it a couple times um, and certain herbs are used to help with the smell and um, getting the cord to dry faster. So it's just a term that's used. We already talked about cesarean section. About 32% of the women in the U.S. are delivering by cesarean section now. Um, the World Health Organization talks about how if the national cesarean section rate is above 10 to 12%, we're causing more harm to moms and babies than good. So that's the big hallmark of midwives and out-of-hospital births. The C-section rate is tends to be around the 8 to 10% um, because we do do it more for medical reasons versus these other things part of our, our system at play. Spontaneous delivery of the placenta, meaning after the baby was born, the, the placenta naturally separated from inside the uterine wall on its own. Manual delivery of placenta is when the midwife or the care provider has to go in and help separate the placenta. It's usually more of a medical emergency situation where she's bleeding a lot, it's partially separated, um, maybe it's separated but there's a part of the placenta, a lobe, like an axillary lobe that's present uh, that has to come off and detach because the concern is if the placenta is still in there or part of it is separated there's a lot of big arterial blood vessels that'll just keep bleeding and bleeding and for the uterus to clamp down nice and firm on those blood vessels the placenta has to come out so medical complications um, this is more of if there's something prenatally during birth if there's concerns that arise it's helpful for the care team to understand what they need especially in things 
minutes matter during the birth, like the newborn resuscitation, shoulder dystocia, postpartum hemorrhage, those non-reassuring heart tones, those things it's really important for the entire birth team to understand what those terms mean, what each person's role is during those situations, and what interventions are done and why. So placenta previa has to do with the placenta being um, over the cervix and have to deliver by a C-section. Uh, marginal insertion is a low-lying placenta where it's near the cervix, but it's not over it. Uh, gestational diabetes is the diagnosis that some women will get um, in the first trimester, but it's usually around 28 weeks gestation where she does her GTT, her glucose tolerance testing. Um, and then they find out that her body isn't processing insulin as well as it should be. And there's extra blood sugar um, that's occurring higher levels in her body that can affect her and baby. PIH has to do with pregnancy-induced hypertension. Um, there's newer algorithms out there, um, depending on the stage, if it's diagnosed before 20 weeks, after 20 weeks. Um, and then if there's labs that are abnormal, it'll switch to preeclampsia. So there's a lot with PIH and that's closely managed with a doctor and they may or may not be a good candidate for out of hospital birth. Um, threatened preterm labor means she's having contractions, she's having signs that we're worried the baby will come out earlier than 37 weeks gestation. Um, preterm delivery is the baby actually delivered before 37 weeks gestation. Arrest of labor is a very common um, use of, in the hospital setting. I see it less often in out of hospital births where we have more of a longer normal variation labor curve. Um, so the common reasons for arrest of labor that the labor has stopped or slowed down has to do with cephalopelvic disproportion. It's a fancy medical term meaning the baby's head is supposedly too big to fit through the pelvis. Um, and then posterior presentation, that baby asyncletic meaning it's turned a little bit or posterior meaning that it's sunny side up, its head isn't, in the, it's, it's just got a larger diameter of the head to try to fit through the pelvis. I always stress with the rest of the labor that birthing is so instinctual. We are mammals, and if we don't feel comfortable and we don't feel safe in our environment, we will shut down our own labor. So a lot of times the arrest of labor is purely this mom needs to be given a more comfortable space, given um, given an environment where she is able to ask questions, she can get let her guard down. If she doesn't feel comfortable, she will shut down her own labor and then we will the concern in the hospital setting is she's on a time clock versus in the home setting we can we can give her a break we can go sleep on the couch um, we can give that space to let her get back especially when the birth team just shows up a lot of times the birth will switch up a little bit just because of the new people in the birth environment Arrested descent has to do with more of the pushing stage and the baby um, sitting at the same station, the same part of the internal pelvis for a while after pushing for a couple hours and not making progress. Um, that could be due to based on position, um, the, the shape of the pelvis, the strength of the contractions. Um, sometimes an underlying infection will make like the strength of the contractions weaker. So there's a lot of variables that can cause that. Maternal exhaustion, she's not able to push anymore. Um, posterior presentation. Meconium aspiration syndrome, um, it's rare, but it's more common with that thick um, particulate meconium when the baby comes out and is having a lot hard time breathing because those little pieces of meconium that were in the amniotic fluid are inside the um, alveoli of the lungs. Non-reassuring fetal heart rate, fetal distress, um, can be bradycardia less than 110 beats per minute or greater than 160 tachycardia. Um, it's looking at the underlying causes. If the heart rate is low, then did the cord get kinked? Is there any vaginal bleeding? Is there concerns with the placenta? Um, is she having too many contractions together? Um, is she hyperventilating and not getting good oxygen through the bloodstream that's now allowing her to not get good oxygen to her baby? Um, did the cord get kinked? So repositioning, giving her a little bit of oxygen, giving her lots of water throughout the labor. Those are preventative things to help. Um, tachycardia, where it's faster, um, can be from stress during labor. Um, it tends to be more of like a fever. Um, babies will show the fever before the mom does, half hour, hour before the temperature will be shown on the mother, especially if the water's been broken for quite a while. 
and she's GBS negative or GBS positive, and there's been frequent vaginal exams that increases the chances of infection. Um, newborn resuscitation has to do with the NRP, the newborn resuscitation program. I encourage all birth workers in out of hospital setting to have that certification. Um, it's the active steps to, if a baby comes out and doesn't have a good muscle tone, um, isn't actively trying to breathe on its own, poor color, this is the heart rate's less than 100. This is the step-by-step -step algorithm to resuscitate and help the baby with transitioning from inside the mother to breathing on its own. Shoulder dystocia has to do with the head is out and the shoulders are stuck um, traditionally on a bony part of the mom's pelvis. Um, there's some rotational issue. There's some shape issue. Maybe the shoulders are too broad and the certain angle that it currently is in the pelvis. So it's, it is a medical emergency because when the head is out, and there's that tightness, the cord is being kinked and you're impairing the blood flow to the brain. And so minutes do matter with shoulder dystocias, getting moms in a different position. We have a lot of courses on shoulder dystocia, um, but it is something important for the birth team to understand and what each person's role is during that situation. Postpartum hemorrhage has to do with the mom bleeding more than a thousand milliliters of blood the first 24 hours. Usually a postpartum hemorrhage is, is, cons is a higher risk and a concern those first 30 to 60 minutes after the baby is born. Um, there's many different causes for a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, it could be the traditional, the uterus is boggy, it's not getting nice and firm. Uterine atony is another word for that. Um, so those blood vessels that had been exposed from the placenta separating inside the mom's uterus are now just relaxed and the blood's coming from those. So you want the uterus to clamp down. So that's why breastfeeding is awesome. Getting that high surge of oxytocin, pitocin, um, can really help to keep the uterus firm. If there's clots, if there's a little bit of placenta left inside the uterus, that can be other causes for the uterus to not be nice and firm. Um, other common, less common causes of postpartum hemorrhage would be a cervical laceration, a tear on the cervix um, from the baby being born, uh, a laceration, a vaginal laceration that's more arterial, that there's a blood vessel that needs to be stitched. Um, there's a lot of different causes of a hematoma. Um, there's a lot of different potential causes for a postpartum hemorrhage. Placenta abruption has to do with the placenta separating um, during labor before it was supposed to. It could be partial. It could be complete. You have to remember the placenta is the baby's lifeline. And so if the cord rips, there gets a true knot in the cord. The cord gets kinked. The placenta isn't working properly. Um, it starts to separate earlier than it's supposed to. Those are very serious things to the baby. That's baby's oxygen lifeline. And so you're going to see significant stress in the baby and you're going to see with a placenta abruption lots of bleeding if her water is broken. Um, if her water isn't broken, you'll have a lot of pain happening because of the extra blood that's going, and that is a minutes matters emergency situation. Episiotomy is more common practice, used to be in the 1990s. It's the routine cutting of the mom's perineum when the baby is being born. It's rare, thank goodness, nowadays. It's more used as a medical intervention if there's non-reassuring heart tones and the baby needs to be delivered towards the end. And the only thing kind of holding the baby up is that perineum, especially first time mamas. Um, so I've had to a couple times over the years do an episiotomy, but it's definitely not my favorite. Um, assisted delivery is something in the hospital setting, just more aware. There's two types of assisted deliveries that a doctor can do. A vacuum assisted delivery where it's like a suction cup that goes on the top of baby's head and a forcep. They look like two big salad tongs. I would say I see more commonly um, the vacuum. It has lower um, litigation and it's just the training of the area. Do they train more in vacuum or forceps? These are medications for labor and birth. Pitocin, oxytocin um, is sometimes used to get labor going in the hospital setting to help accelerate the labor process if um, it's slowing down. Um, postpartum is part of active management of third stage to decrease the chances of a postpartum hemorrhage. In the more out-of-hospital setting, 
uh, Pitocin is kept in the vials and ready just in case there's that postpartum hemorrhage and can be given to the mom. I am or um, if she are I am meaning intramuscularly so in her thigh or if she has an IV site that you could put it in some fluid and give her um, to help keep the uterus firm after the baby delivers. Side attack mesoprostol is another medication um, can be given it can be given orally or it can be given rectally um, during postpartum hemorrhage. It's another um, ripening, cervical ripening agent that's given orally or vaginally in the hospital setting to get labor going. But traditionally in the out-of-hospital setting, Cytotec is a medication that's second line after Pitocin for postpartum hemorrhage. Cervidil, just in the hospital setting, um, it's similar to Cytotec for inducing labor. It's a little bit of a different prostaglandin class. Um, it's like a little tiny tea bag that can stay in for 12 hours and you can take it out if you need to. It's a lot more expensive than Cytotec. So most hospital settings tend to use Cytotec every four hours um, versus a Cervidil every 12. Hemabate and methargen are less common um, postpartum hemorrhage medications. You have to be careful knowing, does she have a history of asthma? Does she have a history of hypertension issues? There's more um, potential complications with those medications. So those are third line traditionally for a postpartum hemorrhage. Um, anesthesia versus analgesia. Um, anesthesia has to do with more putting to sleep, um, for a c-section analgesia has to do with more pain relief um, like stadol, nubane, fentanyl. Um, some hospitals have nitrous oxide which is in this picture um, and I stress the big thing with epidurals it's just good informed consent whether you're the doula in a hospital setting or um, you did a transfer and she's had a long labor and wants an epidural um, I did my thesis in graduate school on epidurals, so it's a really important topic to me to just get the, the birth team to give good informed consent, the true risk and benefits involved um, with this procedure so that the mom and the family can make a good decision. So postpartum terminology, um, the big one in the hospital setting, I don't see it so much in the out of hospital setting, is that golden hour, really respecting that first hour after the baby comes out so that they're not in, un, not interrupting the mom and baby's bonding and nursing and being able to enjoy each other. There's a lot of tasks that the labor and delivery nurse traditionally has to do in the hospital setting before going to postpartum. And so respecting that first hour, that golden hour after baby comes out. Fundal height is prenatally used to measure that the baby is growing appropriately and then postpartum it's used to make sure that the uterus is right in the middle where it is compared to the belly button is it nice and firm um, if she has to go to the bathroom it tends to be a little elevated and off to the side and can cause a little more bleeding so the fundal height is just important to keep an eye on those first few hours after delivery to make sure there's no bleeding concerns Lochia is that postpartum vaginal discharge after the baby comes out. Ruba is those first few hours, that real bright red bleeding. Cirrus is when it switches over to more of like a, a clearish red discharge. You see it at the tail end of your men menstrual cycle. Elba is that last final stage um, of the lochia. The it's like the next couple of weeks after the baby is born. Um, exclusively breastfeeding. The baby's not getting anything else by mouth besides the mom's breast milk. Tandem nursing has to do with nursing two babies at the same time. Um, maybe she has a toddler that's one year old, those Irish twins, or um, even a two, three year old. So nursing two of her children at the same time. Breast pump versus hand expression. Um, so women can get milk out in other ways for their baby if they're separated. A breast pump can do that. And I've loved hand expression because you can do it anywhere. It's a great tool to teach women. Um, if they're engorged, they're in the shower, they can get some of the milk off. Um, so your hands are always with you. So a breast pump is a tool you have to carry all the time. And if she's needing to express some of the milk for one reason or another, hand expression is a great option to show her how to do. Engorgement is a common um, symptom women will have when the milk comes in around day three to five. She'll have colostrum the first few days, um, but the engorgement, some women gets pretty significant. Um, it's this mass inflammatory response as the milk's coming in. Um, so there's a lot of swelling, there's a lot of tenderness. Women will describe their breasts feeling like boulders, um, especially women with larger breasts, pendulous breasts, um, there's a lot of edema they get at the base of their breasts, so it's harder to latch the baby on. Um, it's short-lived, so keep encouraging nursing and 
helping to get a good latch for the baby. Postpartum blues, depression, and psychosis. Um, postpartum blues is pretty common. I would say about 80% of women. Those first few days, especially their first baby, it's a lot of transitions. It's that emotional highs and lows that the mother is having. She'll be very happy and then she'll have tears coming down. She doesn't know if she can be a good mother and she feels on top of the world. Those emotional swings are very normal and common. Um, when it starts getting into postpartum depression, um, I would say 30% of women get more to that next stage and it's harder to get through it. You start getting sad. You not want to put makeup on. You don't want to go out of your house. You're, you're losing your identity. You're you're really starting to feel sad more than you are happy. Rare, thank goodness, postpartum psychosis is where the woman isn't getting good sleep. She's not getting good care of herself. There's some sort of neurological imbalance at play and she's really went off the deep end. She's just having, she's having these crazy thoughts, um, thoughts about harming her baby, thoughts about just the darndest thing, uh, her mind is not working properly and many women in postpartum psychosis have to be become inpatient and it's a pretty extensive um, treatment process. Newborn terminology, so spontaneous respiration, we talked about that. That has to do with the baby crying on its own after it's been born. Apnea is when the baby doesn't have any cries when it comes out. Um, newborn resuscitation, we talked about that briefly, is the act of the birth team helping the baby um, to breathe when it comes out. PPV is positive pressure ventilation. You'll hear that a lot as the first line action to do with an ambu bag when the baby is born and not breathing in good muscle tone and bradycardia. Acrocyanosis has to do, it's a normal finding, um, the hands and feet are a bluer color versus the chest is nice and pink and that's normal the first couple days after the baby is born. Alert, easy to arouse are good reassuring signs. The baby's looking around, cooing, crying, um, hearing sounds, responding appropriately to its new environment. Good versus poor muscle tone. So that's a really good indicator that good oxygen, the baby's transitioning well. Good muscle tone is strong. Um, there's some resistance versus poor. The babies are floppier. They're weaker. Um, you just wonder about what's going on. There's two types of newborn assessments, just like we talked about the maternal assessment. Um, the newborn assessment, right when the baby comes out, there's a brief initial assessment just to make sure that the baby's adjusting well. Um, after the baby has nursed and been bonding with its mom for an hour, hour and a half, we'll usually do a good thorough head to toe assessment um, after when the mother's getting up to the bathroom, just checking out um, everything on the baby, the measurements, the heart rate, making sure there's no irregularities, there's no extra fingers, there's no abnormal skin rashes, moles, there's nothing concerning on this baby. And then repeat exams are a little more focused, um, vital signs, the good, cardiovascular system assessments. So making sure that the baby's breathing well, that muscle tone, the heart rate is good, the baby's nursing well. Those are more focused follow-up assessments. Low birth weight. Um, the baby was born and there's specific parameters after you weigh the baby to make sure um, based on gestational age is the baby in the where we'd expect range is the baby weighing less. Um, especially babies that are low birth weight, you tend to Keep a closer eye on them because they can get colder easier, um, extra calories keeping them bundled up and watching them closer. Macrosomia has to do with bigger babies, large gestational age during pregnancy, and then the baby when it's born, there's an actual algorithm based on um, how many gestational weeks old the baby is and what the baby had weighed. And those babies, um, just like the smaller ones, even though they've got extra roly polies, they tend to want to eat more. They have a higher um, metabolic demand. And depending if there was some undiagnosed gestational diabetes, you want to watch the baby's sugars and the temperatures on that baby. Jaundice is um, the yellowing of the baby's skin. If the jaundice, the yellowing of the skin comes on the first 24 hours, that's called pathological jaundice. And that's much more concerning than physiological jaundice that can come on around day three to five from breastfeeding. Um, the, the liver doesn't break down the bilirubin on its own as well as our body did for the baby. So the during the pregnancy, the mom's body did all the filtering of the blood. So it takes the baby a little 
little learning curve, but when it comes on those first 24 hours, it's not one of those learning curves or some underlining condition happening. Co-sleeping, um, it's usually not recommended in the United States. Internationally, it's more of the norm. So that's the baby actively sleeping next to the mother, the parents. Um, there's great bassinets you can get attached to the beds now for co-sleeping versus just the bassinet. Um, so it's just one of those terms to be aware of. SIDS is sun, sudden infant death syndrome, and that's part of the concerns with doing co-sleeping. Um, soft blankets, a, a cushion, a surface that's not firm. Um, you worry about sudden infant death syndrome with babies. It's a very sad thing when it happens. So APGAR scoring, this is something really important that the midwife and the midwife apprentice will be giving the baby um, at one minute and five minutes, and it's standard in the hospital setting. It's, it's more at five minutes a signal of good oxygenation or concerns long-term with the baby, um, so brain development. Um, it, it doesn't determine how you do neonatal resuscitation. It's more just a score when the baby comes out. Um, activity, pulse, grimace, appearance, and respiration. So um, when the baby at one minute of life, the midwife, the birth provider, will be doing just a quick assessment. Okay, is the muscle tone good? What's the heart rate like? Um, how's the baby acting? What's the color of the chest? What's the color of the hands? And you get points for that. So traditionally in an out-of-hospital setting, um, I'd say nine and 10 are pretty common. So nine at one minute of age and 10 at five minutes of age, especially water births, it tends to be a little delayed. Um, and that's just normal. So it tends to be more like seven and nine. Um, in the hospital setting, it's pretty standard. Most babies, when they're a, a good bill of health, it's an eight and nine score that they a new ballad scoring more has to do with if you have concerns about gestational age. Um, she's 42 weeks, but the baby comes out and looks 38, 37 weeks gestation. This assessment is really helpful um, to score the baby on that developmental. I don't see it used very often in not a hospital setting, but just being aware of what it is. So a latch assessment, um, these are really important objective tools to tell um, the pediatrician, to tell the lactation consultant. Um, it's good objective scoring to give how well is the baby nursing? Are you hearing audible swallows? What type of nipples does she have? Does she have inverted um, where they're kind of tilted in a little bit? Are they flatter? Are they averted? Um, which are the nicer nipples to work with with breastfeeding? Um, how comfortable is she? Is she engorged right now? Um, are her her breasts nice and soft um, does she need a lot of help with breastfeeding what positions is she trying um, how is the baby is the baby alert and easy to arouse it just gives a good score to see how the breastfeeding has been going during your care Commonly confused words. Um, I hear this often with the type of birth attendants and more in the mainstream society, not knowing what a midwife is, confusing a doula with a midwife. What's the responsibility of an assistant, a birth assistant, a midwife assistant? Um, and getting a good conversation with your birth team, what each person's responsibility is. Just because they're a doula, I have a conversation. What do, what do you view yourself as a doula? What is your responsibility part of this birth and having that conversation? Um, physiological versus medical management of birth. Um, they're very different philosophies of care. Midwives tend to be physiological minded, more normal. Um, birth has variations of normal and we have our skills for emergency situations just in case. Um, we're lifeguards at the pool, we're there, we're helping to make sure this birth goes nice and smoothly. Versus the medical management, medical model of, of birth tends to be physician training and that birth is a disease process and it needs to be treated and the mother needs to be cured. So there's a very different when midwives tend to talk to doctors, you have that discrepancy of terminology and thought processes from training. So like a deliver, deliver versus catch. Midwives tend to say catching the baby because the mother is the one delivering the baby. Um, it's that paternalistic mindset of the healthcare provider is delivering the baby and taking that, that power away from the mother. So client versus patient. So client tends to be out of hospital community based um, people we're taking care of versus patients are inpatient and tends to be more of a medical based um, word used for the, the women. 
birth center. I hear this often when you talk to insurance companies, you talk to families. Um, when I was a labor and delivery nurse for years, when people would answer the phone, hi, this is so-and-so's birth center. I'm like, no, you're a labor and delivery unit. You're an inpatient facility. Um, so what is the difference between inpatient birth center labor and delivery units versus a freestanding birth center? They have very different philosophies of care. The patients they take care of are very different. So it's important to, and talking to insurance companies, especially advocating for your family, don't assume when you say they cover a birth center, find out is it inpatient versus outpatient. True versus false labor. This one's a tricky one because in, at the moment it's sometimes hard to tell. It's more of as time goes on. If she kicks into labor and she has a baby, this is true labor. But if it fizzles out, she's for six, eight hours having good hard contractions, thinking this is labor, but it actually doesn't, it goes away and it doesn't end up a baby coming out. That's false labor. So in the moment, sometimes it's really hard to tell, even for midwives. And time is just one of those things as it can does it get closer and stronger with time or is it kind of come and go irregular um, especially at night time if she's had a long day been very active you tend to get more of those stirrings of false labor so taking a bath resting drinking lots of water it's either going to progress to the next level for labor or it's going to go away and she'll have labor, her actual labor later Bloody show versus vaginal delivery those are really important things as a midwife um, vaginal show vaginal bleeding is bright red period bleeding and you worry about the placenta with that um, versus bloody show is more of mucousy. It's a reassuring sign that means that the cervix is opening and softening for the labor process. So as a midwife and a care provider, they mean very different things in our assessment process. Rupture of membranes versus incontinence. So if she calls me and says, I think my water broke, there's always questions I ask. Is it still leaking? Did it just happen one time? Did you sneeze? Did you cough? Um, sometimes women can pee on themselves, especially when they're towards the end, the baby hits the bladder, there's not much room, um, the pelvic floor is weaker. So it's always really important to determine, did the water actually break or did she have some urination? We already talked about the rupture membranes, induction versus augmentation. So induction is the medical um, causing of labor to get started versus augmentation is the excel. She's already been in labor, um, but she's been at six centimeters for six hours. And now um, in the hospital setting, they're talking about starting Pitocin and something to help encourage the speeding up and strengthening of the contraction. So it's medical, um, medical use of getting labor to the next level. Post-term versus post-dates. This one I hear often get mixed up. So post-term is as soon as she hits her due date. So she's 40 weeks in one day. A lot of the medical terminology is post-term. So that 40 to 42 post-dates is past 42 weeks gestation. Newborn versus fetus. So fetus is inside of the mother during the pregnancy. Newborn is as soon as the baby is born, that first um month of life and then they transition to a baby after that. Timing and contractions. This is a great education for families and even just newer people to the birth team. Timing and contractions is the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next one. It's not when one ends. It's not that gap because people will say, I feel like I'm not going to break. You tell me my contraction is every three minutes, two minutes. She may have really long contractions and there is a short gap in between them. That resting period is short. So timing of contractions has to do with the beginning of one to the beginning of the next contraction. And that's the mom's perception, not from the midwife palpating. Consultation collaboration versus supervisory relationship. I think this is a really important description of these three terms when you are a midwife and depending on your state regulations, um, your relationship with your medical community, there's a huge difference between these three terms and it gets muddy together often. So consultation has to do with you can be working together. You don't have to be working together. You could be independent practices. You're consulting. You're asking for advice. Um, 
Doctors do it all the time to specialists. So you're consulting your colleague. Um, collaboration is working closely together. You've got more of a relationship. It can be in writing, it can be informally. You're collaborating together to improve the care. Um, supervisory relationship, which is very common in Southern states for midwives. Um, many state regulations will say it's a supervisory relationship. So it means that there's this hierarchy at play where the midwife is underneath of the physician and the practice relationship is really in details of what the physician feels the midwife should be doing versus they're more of a same level team and a collaboration. So they're very specific terms that mean very different things and it's important for midwives and birth team to use them clearly and be able to clearly talk about the differences. Why is it so important to understand terminology? There are so many words in the birth community, um, so many ways to advocate for families, so many ways to talk to your birth colleagues, and we all want to be on the same page. If you're using an acronym or a term or a reference, um, we want to be able to talk the same talk. If there is a safety issue happening during a birth and minutes matter, we don't want breakdowns of communication so that we get a good transport, we get a good interventions, each person in the birth team understands their roles. If if the midwife says one thing, we want everyone on the team to understand what that term me or the acronym means. Um, we're professionals in our out of hospital setting and we need to be able to use words that are commonly known in the society, in the birth world, in the medical community when we are transitioning and we are discussing history and we're discussing um, the standards of practice for these women. So it is our obligation to be able to understand basics of medical terminology, understand what they mean and what they are so we can talk the talk and be very professional for our families, improve our outcomes of care. Thank you for listening.